All righty. Well, thank you all for joining us here today. We'll be talking about when friends and family don't get it. And for just a way of uh, introduction, I'm Shua Allegra. I'm the program manager for uh, the Philadelphia Family Support Projects here, which I'll talk about in a little bit. I'm also a uh, mother to three amazing children and our family. The list of diagnoses go long and long, but autism is one of them, uh, cerebral palsy, Kleinfeld syndrome, ADHD, ODD, OCD, all the acronyms. It's for something it feels like. We don't have all of them, but it feels a lot. Uh, but I'm also a per identified as a disabled woman, so I... Um, I bring all of that to the table, where I guess, when we, I want to support families. So I come in as a caregiver, but also as someone with disabilities. And, uh, and you no, know, it's my joy to be supporting other families, sharing things that, you know, I've learned along the way on my own journey, but also professionally. My background is in human services, but I also did a postgrad program in rehabilitation counseling. So supporting people with disabilities, have meaningful lives. And so all of that we bring to the table and we support families in, um, taking care of themselves as they take care of others, right? So a lot of the things I do involve around trauma, form care, um, mindfulness, and person-centered thinking. I'll pass it to Sarah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sarah. I'm a family support specialist for the Birth to Five Project. I am a mother of four children. Two of my children have disabilities. Um, prior to this, I was a special education teacher, um, for 10 years, I stopped to help my son as we navigated early intervention and many medical appointments. I just really have a passion to support families um, with children with disabilities. And I just really learned, like to learn, learn about their experiences and the perspective of people with disabilities. So we'll talk a little bit about what we do here. Um... If you're new to us, so Vision for Equality is kind of our, you know, the organization that we work under and Vision for Equality been in existence for three decades, supporting people with disabilities and their caregivers. And then um, the Philadelphia Family Project started a little over two years, we're getting to two and a half year, years here. And we, um, under that department, our department here, there are three projects per se that we have. One of them is the system navigation um, project where we literally do that. We help families navigate the system. We connect them with uh, resources and services in the community, but it's not just connecting them. It's actually teaching families kind of, you know, hands on, hands on training if you want how to, how to do that for themselves so that they can learn the ways to connect with all the systems of care, right? Educational, developmental disability, intellectual disability, um, medical and behavioral health and so forth, but also just finding resources, you know, that might be there, whether it's finding a school in the community, uh, after school programs, support groups, and so forth. And um, with that, all of us here are, are peers in the sense where everyone here on our team is a caregiver. So we bring that you know, that to the table per se, and we can not just relate to families, but also be kind of beacons of hope to say that, you know, yes, there are hard days, but it's still, you know, it, it is doable. You can do this with your supporting you. And through connecting families with, with supports and services per se, families feel more you know, more connected, more supported, and definitely feel less isolated because they're, they kind of have a, someone to walk with them on that journey. And the next project, there is a trauma-informed care project, which you know, helps families one identify um, kind of their experience and be able to take care of their own emotional health as well. Uh, often care, as caregivers, we don't always realize that the stress of you know, taking care of someone else, being there for others can be stressful, but sometimes that stress can turn into trauma. And if you're not sure how we have trainings we've done in the past that we can actually send you links to recording to talk about some of what, what trauma looks like or can look like in your life. But through this um, project, the Trauma Informed Care Project, not only we're introducing a lot of families to the idea, the concept of trauma and how to prevent it, how to deal with it, then we also do what we call caregiver stress series. So we do a lot of trainings that talk about things that typically will stress or often can be a stressor for families and not just how to resolve the situation, but how we take care of ourselves 
in the midst of those things. Like, you know, for example, when uh, we have a loved one who's in and out the hospital often, right? Uh, transition and dealing with family dynamics and things like that. But in addition to the workshops we provide, we also then have, um, we, we have access and connection with a with um, a mental health clinic for families who need it. We can make with not just referrals for mental health services, but also we, um, it's need based and it's you no know, funding funding available. We can cover up to three sessions um, of counseling for a family who need that trauma therapy. And then we offer virtual support groups and where families can come and yes, talk about what's going on in their lives, but also celebrate the wins and then learn ways to actually uh, deal with the, the stress that they're going through. And we do a lot of things or coping skills, but we touch into a lot of you know evidence based. Um, approaches per se, like um, journaling, meditation, other mindfulness activities. We do CBT, where it's called behavioral therapy we, and, um, techniques, you know, in order to help to help all of us sometimes reframe what we're looking at and so that, you know, it, we can um, we can deal with it a little better. But we also offer peer-to-peer -peer support, where if the, if the caregiver is having a rough day, they can just call or email and then have someone, again, who is walking that journey, a similar journey, be there to support them as well, kind of offering their listening ear on the tough day. The last pro project here I'm going to talk about, it's kind of our babies, and it'd be actually a baby project that takes care of all the babies. So <laughs> this project is what we call targeting families of young children, and often here you will see it on the floors as birth to five per se, birth to five projects. So this workshop falls under the birth to five project. And with that project, is we're pretty much uh, combining the system medication project I talked about and the time and care project by targeting it to families who have loved one between the ages of zero and five. So through that, you know, we're doing trainings that like this one, very you know, targeted for the, the, those families. We, have, we also have a virtual support group for families of, you know, with loved one birth to five. In addition to that, they you know have the one-on-one -on -one support, connect them to resources. But especially when you are just, you finding out or even trying to figure out if your loved one, your child um, might have a disability or a delay, it can be overwhelming. So through this project, we help you kind of connect the dots and you know, figure out where you go after you put a diagnosis or even where to go to get a diagnosis. But then helping you, you know, empowering families to know that a diagnosis is not, you know, life does not stop there, right? This just helps us to get the support that our loved one needs to have a fulfilling life. And then we help families start dreaming bigger, right? Creating a vision for the loved one and for themselves. And so that from the get-go, they can feel empowered to create an everyday life for the loved one and also not fall for the cracks of our many, many systems that we deal with. So Sarah and uh, now Melissa are work under this project. So if you're getting this recording or here and be here with us right now, if you need support and you have a loved one between the ages of zero and five, then those two lovely ladies will be the ones supporting you. And now I'll pass it to Sarah and take take it from there. So we're gonna talk about when family and friends misunderstand our children with disabilities. So the agenda is that we're gonna talk about um, how family and friends misunderstand our children's disabilities, getting family and friends on board, even well-meaning or not preparing for painful comments and evaluating the need for a response, planning ahead for events with family and friends and taking a step back and reevaluating relationships. Sorry. Okay. So what does it look like when friends and family and friends don't understand. They do not accept your child with disabilities. They do not understand your child's behaviors, traits, interests, or needs. They do not understand or deny your child's diagnosis. They give unsolicited advice, say painful comments, ask impolite questions, participate in disappointing stares, and act inappropriately. They minimize your concerns and feelings, and they're out of touch with the needs of the caregivers and the child. So why do family and friends not understand? There's generation differences that they're stuck in their ways. Um, there's the fear of stigma that disability is a bad thing. They hold outdated, incorrect information about disabilities. Um, they see diagnosis as an excuse um, and they see themselves in the child. 
So like by talking about your child's diagnosis, um, you could be repeatedly telling them that they have that diagnosis. They think your child's just being themselves. So they, they're reluctant to see that the traits of the disability being anything other than what they know your child as. Um, inability to be compassionate. Sometimes people don't know how to act or what to say, and they have feelings of shame, fear, and anger. So we experience unsolicited advice, painful comments, <laughs> and polite questions. Um, I have a long list of them. I'll just go through a few of them. Um, you'll hear everyone's a little autistic. Um, my child would never act like that. You're overacting. It's a mistake to give everyone who is a little different a diagnosis. What's wrong with her? She'll probably grow out of it. Some children are just slow. Have you tried essential oils? Um, there's nothing wrong with them. It's just poor parenting. And when will she grow out of it? She'll eat when she's hungry. Um, what's wrong with her? Why does she talk? Why does she talk like that? Why can't your child just sit still? You're just making excuses for bad behavior. I struggle too, but I turned out okay with without any help. So here's some. Those were some examples of the negative comments or responses or questions that we can, as caregivers, receive. So who's affected um, by these comments, advice, and questions? So the child with disabilities, um, the child may not know people are reacting to them, and other times they may be upset that they're reacting, um, upset by the reactions. It's kind of dependent on their age, their awareness, and the situation. Um, caregivers are almost always affected. Caregivers spend the most time um, with their child and receive the most reactions. And siblings can be very sensitive to people's reactions as well. It's kind of dependent again on their age and um, the situation. And then other people in your child's life, like grandparents and friends. So why are we stressed? Unless you're raising child disabilities, you do not understand like the daily challenges. Caregivers are often stressed with responsibilities. Instead of getting support from family and friends, they face rejection, judgment, criticism, and shame. So people who should have their backs and would, and would help to have them have their support. And you want friends and families to develop a strong relationship with your child. So they don't see all the work that you do to support your child. I think a lot of times we hear from Others that, oh, your child's fine, but they don't see all the doctor's appointments, the therapies, um, education meetings. Um, and it's added stress to worry about the recognition and acceptance from family and friends. Like we already have, as caregivers, have to worry about recognition and acceptance in the community, at school, at recreational activities. Um, it's an added stressor to worry about that with family and friends. And as caregivers, we bear the responsibility for inclusion. And sometimes our child um, bears the responsibility for inclusion. And, but why is it not our friends and family's responsibility for inclusion? And we want um, others to understand, but at the same time, we don't want every conversation to be talking about raising a child with disabilities. So getting family and friends on board. So this is how we can get family and friends on board. Assume a positive intent. So go in with assuming that things are positive and find out more. You don't want to be um, putting up your guard first because you want to have an open and safe conversation with um, a family or friends. Um, take time to talk to them about it. Ask how they're honestly feeling and why they're having such a challenging time. And let them explain. This is a hard part, just to be quiet and listen. Um, focus on sharing exactly what's preventing them from getting on board. And remain positive. Like, talk about your child's disability in positive terms. Having disability is not a bad thing. And you are going to talk about your child's limitations. But also talk about your child's strengths. 
and give them clear examples what you ex exactly need for them to do. Give them clear examples of the type of behavior you would appreciate from them. For example, when Johnny's having meltdown, please give us space and let me take the lead. Um, educate yourself so you can be a better advocator, and then you can pass that information along to your family and friends. Um, also begin where they um, they are. Find out what they already know and use that as a jumping point and then guide them to quality resources to learn more. And maybe they're not avid readers, so there's a bunch of videos from people with disabilities teaching others, or you can highlight Parts. You can read the book and highlight parts that you just want them to review. Um, and you can get them involved, invite them to therapies, evaluations, doctor appointments, and more. And then have patience with your family and friends. Um, give them time to process their emotions. And then you might have to let it go. Um, in some cases, after listening and explaining, um, that there comes a point where you have to accept that you might this person may never get on board, and they're not willing to give you the support you need, you might have to give them up. And find support. Create relations with people who get it. Find support in other family memberships and friends. Seek similar situations. Join a support group. Talk to a therapist. Network on social media. So well-meaning or not, preparing for painful comments and evaluating, evaluating the need for a response. So when you get a, a negative response, ask yourself two questions before responding to a question, comment, or advice. Do I dignify this with a response and do I want to respond now? Because you can choose your battles and not respond. That's totally okay not to respond. So when you need your response, so it's normal to be upset and hurt by negative reactions, and there's no right way to respond. And depending on how you're feeling that day, the situation, where you are, who you're with, will be dependent on how you're going to respond. So if you're going to respond, think before you reply. Like, no one is ever prepared for painful or rude comments or questions, so pause before responding. And you can take the opportunity to educate. Um, sometimes I feel like helping the other person by educating them about your child's disability. Um, use a standard response. Sometimes a standard response is all you need. For example, it's complicated um, to explain. It's okay. I'd rather not talk about this. And let people know you're hurt so that next time they're careful. So creating a standard response, therefore you have a plan. Um, you can create standard responses to people's questions and comments in different situations. So what you can do is write down a list of family friends who might have negative reactions, put them in different groups based on who they are and what they mean to you and to your child. And then think about different situations knowing your child's needs. Choose how you want to respond to reactions from each group and use your responses when you need to. So we're, um, and also you can also ask, and maybe also work with if you have a significant other, work on having the same responses or um, taking turns responding to people's um, negative responses. Um, here's a couple examples of standard responses. Um, it sounds like you have questions about Avery. What would you like to know? Did you mean to ask why he has a tube coming out of his belly? Um, I really want to answer this question, but it's a long answer. Can we talk about this sometime in the future? Um, there's more standard responses. Um, I love to run something by you. I know you love my child. It's so clear you want the best for us. But these moments when you say blank in front of my son, it's not helpful to us. I do appreciate your ideas, but I prefer you brought them to me privately. Or if you have any concerns, please take me aside and talk to me rather than my child. So 
So it's also helpful to plan ahead for family um, and friends events. So before the event, send an email or text to open the conversation. And obviously, if you want to do this in person or over Zoom, that works too. Just sometimes um, right when we're it feels more confident in these sort of confrontational um, types of conversations. Um, start by acknowledging their feelings about the your child's outbursts, meltdowns, challenges, and then mention how you're working on this at home or maybe with OT or with the school to support your child through this. And give very clear examples of how you, how, sorry, excuse me, give very clear examples of how they can help you and your child at the event. Be explicit. explicit. Sometimes we think we know what, we think people know what we want, but we don't say it. And try to give them things to do, to do rather than not to do. Like if your child's having a meltdown, saying something about giving them space, letting you take the lead instead of saying, don't look at us, don't ask for help, don't get involved. And then with acknowledging your appreciation for their care, their care for your child, and optional if you want to offer a separate opportunity to discuss more if they want to learn more about it. Um, so let me just sorry. So I'm I'm gonna give you an example of um, an email you could send. Hi mom, I'm so excited for your party this weekend. I wanted to send you a quick note about Molly. I know it's really hard for you and everyone to see your struggle with emotions. As you know, Molly goes to OT every week and we're working on sensory regulation. She's doing so well. It'd be most helpful to both if Molly's, when Molly's getting upset or having a meltdown, please let me handle, ignore and focus your attentions other way, other way, every way, excuse me, elsewhere. Leave Molly alone until I let you know she's ready to come back. I know Molly loves spending so much time with you at the house. And thank you for always wanting the best for her. If you're ever interested in learning more about her brain, how her brain works, let me know. And I'm always up for a chat. So that could be an example of an email to send before a family and friend event. Um, so sometimes we need to take a step back and reevaluate re relationships. There are certain family and friends that do not get the privilege of knowing your child. They're not providing the support that you want. And just because they're friends and family does not mean they're a safe person. And always be aware of how much information to disclose to family and friends based on your needs and feelings. And it takes a lot for parents to trust others to have patience, kindness, and respect for their child. Um, this is kind of when I am determining how much information or how much to show other people, I kind of think of the circles of trust. How am I gonna communicate with this person? Um, how much I'm gonna let them see? Um, am I going to go to their events? So um, the inner circle is people you trust fully and know they will always be there for you. So this person, you're going to, they'll see, can see everything. You can tell them everything. You fully trust them. And there's going to be other people that are in your middle circle. So this circle is for those you are close to, but are a little bit tentative about trusting them fully. So you're not going to always give them all the information. You're going to be a little bit protective of the information you share um about your child and then the outer circle is people in your life that you like love but you don't trust enough so you're really going to be very protective of the information and then protective over the, your child there shouldn't be anyone in your inner circle whom you don't have mutually fulfilling relationships with love care trust and respect like there should be no expectations um, beyond the circle, outer circle, um, they're just people that you don't trust or perhaps don't like. Um, people have to earn your trust and move between outer and inner circles. And then in the end, just share as much information you feel comfortable with. And sometimes people might be in your inner circle and then move to your middle circle and move back to your inner circle. Um, or maybe just depending on the situation. So here's some reflection questions about relationships um, to kind of determine who would be in your inner circle. Do I feel better after spending time with this person? Am I my, myself around this person? Do I feel secure or do I feel like I have to watch what I say and do? Is this person supportive and how am I, am I treated with respect? And is this person I can trust? 
here are um, more reflection questions. Do I feel better after spending time with this person? Um, wait, that's not, sorry, that was, that's not, sorry, that was a mistake. Um, in my, so a person in my circle listens intently, offers compassion and support, steers clear of quick advice and self righteous right to this judgment. They listen to you intently without judging and telling you how to think or feel or try to change the subject. And they kind of point you towards um, wisdom. Um, they don't assume, don't assume she knows what you need, um, challenges you in your own growth with love and encouragement. They're willing to ask for and receive forgiveness when harm occurs. So maybe they do say a negative response, um, seeking to repair relational damage, show a genuine genuine interest in what's going on in your life and what you have to say and how you think and feel. And more about an inner circle person accepts you for who you are, makes you feel you can be yourself, makes you feel respected, shows investment in a relationship and makes you want to share. Um, I just like this quote from Nora Wilde, your child is too in inflexible, said by the adult who refuses to be flexible with my kid. Your child needs to learn about the perspectives of others, said by an adult who's unwilling to consider the perspective of my kid. So I always like that from Nora Wild. Um, then the resources I have, there's um, if you go to this website and scroll down, there's a sensory analogy, a sensory cup analogy. Um, it could help to explain um, your child's sensory needs to families and friends. If your child has um uh, Sensory sensitive, they have a small cup and it gets overflowed very easily by a lot of input or certain input. And then their cup overflows. This indicates a sensory meltdown or dysregulations. And then if you have a sensory seeker, um, it talks about that your child has a really large sensory cup with holes in it and it's really hard to fill their cup, make their cup full. Um, and this is just another analogy about challenging behaviors in baseball. Um, it's from Autistic Advocate, um, which also could help families understand that like when the child is having a hard time, it's not the time for them to learn. Um, you want to be like pro proactive and teach them to use coping strategies or communicate their needs. And instruction can only occur when they're relatively calm. Um, I think also a lot of confusion happens because we have very um, a misconception mode about what is fairness. So this is um, gives a good de def um, definition of fairness. Um, the author always is, often says a child's definition of fair is that everyone gets the same thing, while adults' definition is that everyone gets what they need, although those needs may be different. How many of the relatives are you holding onto the child's definition of fair, and this may be a way to begin the conversation. Um, so we talked about in this um, PowerPoint that you can provide your families with a book. I know when my son was diagnosed with Down syndrome, um, the social worker gave us a book, a general book about Down syndrome, and then I had my family read it. Um, there's many books out there. This is a good book about just general information about disabilities. They have the history, the terms to use, how to be an ally, what to say. Um, and it's a really easy read. And again, you can always read it and just highlight the parts you would like a family member or friend to look at. Um, and if there's any questions. Thanks so much. I'm gonna pause the recording now.